The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. On this episode of Live and Learn, Kristen Stowes and guests Stephanie Chase and Joey Hartman discuss staying active with dance. Tim Francis and guest Dr. Nancy Erickson explore advocating for the disabled. Sam Truax and guest Mary Wilson explain legal issues seniors may encounter. And Dolores Lintel with guest Rick Sutton give us a history of Lincoln's own Fleming Fields. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Kristen Stowes and I have a very appropriate quote to begin our segment today. Dancing is like dreaming with your feet. And I do believe my guests would agree. I'm pleased to introduce Stephanie Chase, Director of Dance at Madonna Proactive, and a student of hers, Joey Hartman, who is in a tap dance class. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stephanie, I think it's fair to say that dance has been your life. <laughs> yes, it has. Yes, it has. <laughs> Could you please tell us how this talent evolved? Well, you know, it, I was six years old, and again, that typical story, dancing around the house, my mom said, oh my. So I uh, <laughs> got to get into classes. I'm the youngest of five, so I was the one that got the lessons. Okay. Um, and uh, I just from six years on until today. You, you know, knew you loved it. I did, I did, <laughs> yes. So eventually you found yourself in New York, and how did that happen? You know, uh, I was teaching, uh, had my own studio in Kearney, Nebraska. Okay. Um, moved out west a little bit, and I was teaching a lot, and I just, I wanted a break, I wanted to go take classes. Mm -hmm. So, um, husband Bob, Chase, and I went out to uh, New York City for a, a summer, okay. and we stayed for 10 years. I mean, really, wow. that is typical, it's a, a long story made short, uh -huh. but um, just fell in love with the city, uh, saw, realized that a lot of the dancers on Broadway were my age, mm -hmm. and um, just, I couldn't get enough of the city. It I was just right. I longer, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> so in 1985, right. you became a Radio City Hall Music Rockette. Right. What a thrill. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> it's, yes. It's, it's totally amazing. Could you please tell us how that came about? Well, it's crazy because I was ready to move back to Nebraska. <laughs> okay. I, I had gone through several uh, rejections at auditions coming down to the last, and I was, I, I had two, went through two auditions with Bob Fosse back okay. in the day, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I was down to the final with twice with him, and I had just, that was it. I wanted to be a Fosse dancer, oh. and I, I had just had it. <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, Radio City has a first ever, first time ever, an uh, audition. Okay. Um, Disney has taken 20 girls out of the lineup of mm -hmm. the 36, mm -hmm. and they need to replace them and they're going to have a, an audition in two weeks and my husband finds this in the paper and he goes, you're everything they want. And I thought, oh, well. So I decided to go, I was on my way home anyway, it didn't matter, I was going, moving back to Nebraska and I think it helped me just enjoy the audition mm -hmm. and not be so pent up and sure. nervous sure. and I had so much fun. And I got my it. My goodness, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So you were in the right place at the right time with the right truly, talent. Truly in the right place oh, at the right time. I yes, love that story. Yes. So after this wonderful experience of being a Rockette, you moved back yes. to Nebraska. Moved back, had a daughter, Sydney, and just had didn't want to be beating the pavement anymore. Sure. I did teach another, when I wasn't performing at Radio City, I taught at Juilliard, and I taught the movement in the drama division. I see. Which, and I did that for about four and a half years, and that was very difficult to leave. Mm -hmm, but I bet. we were ready to come home. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes, we sure. to get closer to family. Sure. So you opened a dance studio. I did. Yes. And eventually you found yourself at Madonna Proactive, <gasps> teaching tap yes. and other dance yes, right. exercise I, classes. Correct, correct. My husband Bob is um, director of uh, group fitness, and I'm director okay. of dance. Okay. And um, we just, we found this incredible mix mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. what we wanted to do, what they wanted, and um, here we are. Again, right place, right oh, time. Yes, yes. So because you were a Rockette, you received an opportunity for your tap class. Could I you did. tell us about that? Yes. Well, I'm a member of the Rockette alumni, okay. and they were going to have a, a big celebration, and I wanted to um, roast, so to speak, the new director <laughs> of Radio <laughs> okay. City of the Rockettes, Linda <laughs> Haberman. Okay. And so they decided to put this wonderful program together and invited 
uh, certain Rockettes that have a Rockette alumni that have dance studios that are I teachers because a lot of us aren't didn't go on to teach. Sure. And so we had to send a video in. Okay. And um, my younger students, it was bad timing for them, and I thought, oh, my adult tap, they are going to be the perfect, and the gals, <laughs> the alumni will love it. Aww. And lo and behold, it all worked <clears throat> out. It was oh, just wonderful. this wonderful timing. It's yes. all about timing. Yep, timing is everything. Mm -hmm. So how long did your tap class prepare for this performance? You know, we worked for th about three and a half months. Yeah. We wow. did, and diligently, at mm -hmm. least three times a week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you went, how many class participants were able to go, and what was the age range of this Ten. Class? Ten ladies dance. Okay. Um, we're in the, pro in the number that I choreographed, and uh, probably 50 to 60. I don't know if they want me to tell it, say that, but they're just, they're, they're young at heart. They weren't they're, youngsters. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> That you no. took. <laughs> so talented. So yes, talented. that's obvious. Mm -hmm. And your audience for this performance, who was in the audience and how many? Well, it was Linda Haberman, of course. Okay. And then her assistant, I danced, Julie uh, Branham. Uh, we were on the line together. Okay. And then management of Radio City, which was very exciting. Oh. And then filled with Rocket alumni from, and there were present Rockettes okay. that were there plus the alumni and mm -hmm. many of them I knew and it was just this wonderful reunion. This really. old home week I'm oh, sure for you. It was wonderful. That's wonderful. Yes. Joey, I'd like to ask you, mm -hmm. how, how did it feel to be able to take part in this trip? Well, it was a chance of a lifetime. I'm, I mean, none of us had any ever idea that we would end up dancing in New York oh for sure, God. let alone for <laughs> experienced tap, da tap dance tap dancers <laughs> but um, wow. we were thrilled that Stephanie asked us to go and and uh, really excited mm. that we got to do it I can imagine and besides the performance you had an itinerary in New York you did several other things what what else mm. were you able to partake in New York well one thing we did together was that we did visit Ground Zero together and um, that was really meaningful uh, I'm sure people in Lincoln remember Jennifer Dorsey Howley Oh, um, yes. The story of her, she was killed in the Trade Center uh -huh. bombing, and so we wanted, I, I, she went to Southeast High School, I taught at mm. Southeast High School, I taught sure. vocal music, and she was a student in the music department. She okay. actually had participated in some of the uh, choirs that I taught. Really? So oh, I, wow. I wanted to find her name, mm -hmm. um, all of mm -hmm. the people who died in the Trade Center, their name their names are around the pools. There's two mm -hmm. large pools, and they are listed with people that they worked with and I that see. were around them on the day that they mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. So we looked her up in the directory, and we went to find her name, and sure. just um, we did that together mm -hmm. and had a little moment there. And well, that's very meaningful. Took some photos. I'm it was sure. very meaningful. Yes, I'm glad we got imagine. to do it. I can imagine. Well, when I watched the tape of your performance, <laughs> you all look so calm, cool, and collected, <laughs> but your heart had to be pumping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. How did it feel to be performing yeah. on stage? Yeah. Well, we were nervous about it. <laughs> we, uh, the stage was smaller than the area that we've been dancing on, and uh, we wore tuxedos for costumes, and that made our shoulders quite a bit wider uh -oh. than we were used to doing. So we were a little, I was on the very end. My, I was a little anxious that maybe I might topple off, but, um, but it all went well, and, yes. and we were very well received, and we had a lot of fun doing yes, it. Yes, yes. And so your costumes were tuxedos mm -hmm. and hats, right? And hats. Fedoras. Hats with sequins. Yep. Oh. <laughs> yes. That's a very classic look, I think, mm. and perfect for someone, yeah. a rockette, to put together because yes. the uniformity of it all. Yes. yes. It was, and very it, classy. It, the, the ten ladies were just they're just these awesome women mm -hmm. and they don't really know how good they are <laughs> but uh, I do and I do and that is the reason I, I motivated this well sir yeah. yeah I can imagine mm -hmm. so Joy if such an opportunity were to come your way again mm -hmm. Would you say yes in a heartbeat? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't even hesitate one minute. If <laughs> Stephanie said, let's do it again, I'd say, I'm first in line. You would be ready. <laughs> I'd be ready. I yeah. bet. I bet. Um, Stephanie, besides just being fun, which dance is, uh, you are using dance to stay fit yes. in a number of classes that you teach. Correct. I was wondering, why do you see dance as a particularly good form of exercise? Well, especially with tap dancing, you it's it's uh, learning rhythm. Okay. Um, again, it, it builds up a little self-confidence, too, mm -hmm. and knowing that you have these shoes on that make sounds. <laughs> but also there's a sequence, like we learning combinations and, 
And I, I just, I think it's so good for the brain. And it, it, mm -hmm. it's a, a time to just forget about everything else in life and just zone in mm -hmm. on a rhythm, uh, fun rhythms, always fun rhythms, good music, mm -hmm. and uh, fellowship. We just, we laugh at the same time we're dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, mm -hmm. it's a combination of just all goodness. Yes, really it yes, is. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the music alone, oh. it just takes you into another it does into another place and you kind of forget what you're doing right yeah you do. yeah and I, try to, I go back I use old music uh, vintage music okay and then current music and um, we love it all yeah well yeah, you don't get bored way. that way there you go mm -hmm. yeah That's exactly exactly, right. exactly mixing up that workout too mm -hmm. it's a different mm -hmm. way sure to mm -hmm. work out so is tap dance in particular mm -hmm. different from other forms of dance well it in is. terms of exercise I mean it, of course it is um, <coughs> I think it's a lot more mental. It's a mental with physical okay. because you've got to remember the count. You've got to remember the choreography, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that's really important. I do. I do. And that is such that's such an interesting point to bring up because I think when we think of dance, we only think of the physical, but it does. It takes a lot of thought, a lot of concentration to get your steps right, right to get them in the right order. Right. And it's different from just holding weights. And we love weights. We, sometimes we incorporate weights mm -hmm. into a warm up. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but um, you you really have to. You can't zone out. You have to be right there, or else mm -hmm. you, they've lost me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So it, sure. again, we're on the same page all the time. Yes. Which is yeah. fun. Yeah. So do you see positive changes in someone who might begin a, a dance exercise class at an older age after they have come for a while? I do, and you know, I think one of the first things I see is just lighting. They lighten up. They, okay. It's it's um, it's fun. They can have mm -hmm. fun. They, um, again, get to meet other people. We actually talk to each other mm -hmm. in between doing combinations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a different discipline, mm -hmm. but in a very good way. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. sure. Are, do you have beginning level classes? We do, classes? absolutely beginning. And if there is a beginner, a beginner student that walks in to the intermediate, we tone it down. We okay. make everybody always feel welcome. Yes. It's, it's very important. Yes. Well, that would be very important. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. You're kind of putting yourself out there when you're dancing. Because you are. When you walk <laughs> in that room, you're putting yourself, you're just putting yourself out there and you're wondering, and I know the women that walk in, mostly it's all women. Sometimes we get a few guys. Okay. Sometimes husbands. Yeah. Okay. They're conned into coming in. <laughs> but, um, and they stay for a while and then they kind of look around. Well. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, uh -huh. we always, always welcome. Okay. Um, the significant others too. That's to wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. Joey, did you take dance lessons when you were a youngster or is this something that you have started as an adult? Mm -hmm. well, I did take dance lessons um, okay. when I was growing up, up through about junior high and um, and then I was on the dance team in high school but since then I haven't danced so this ah. was coming back to something that I had done many years ago oh. and I was really excited. I always loved tap dancing mm -hmm. and I when I saw it was on the the class roster at Madonna I wanted to try it right really? away. And really? so I think I was one Thank of the first story. few people yeah. that came to Stephanie's class when she first started teaching okay. tap dance. All right. So what is it about tap dance that you mm -hmm. enjoy the most as an exercise? Well I I think everything that Stephanie said, you know, that it, you have to think quickly, you have to really focus on what you're doing, and which is a stress reliever because you can't think about things that stress <laughs> you. Um, the music is fun, it's upbeat, Stephanie's fun, and, and she's very upbeat and warm and welcoming when you come into the class, so I always felt good about that. Mm -hmm. And I've made a lot of friends in the class, even our husbands have made friends with each other, Aww. so it's, it's become a social event, not just exercise. So do you ever feel like like not going to class? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, I do have to be honest. I, mean, I have a disability that I'm very achy some days, okay. and I don't feel like doing much, let alone exercising. Mm -hmm. But when I know that I'm going to greet friends, I'm going to have fun doing it, and I'm going to feel better after I'm done, mm -hmm. then that's motivating for me to go. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's very important. Yeah, that says is, a lot about the class and, and everything. Mm -hmm. And so the social interaction really mm -hmm. is huge too. It's huge. Along yeah, it's with really the exercise. Mm -hmm. You have a sense of belonging and that mm -hmm. people know if you're not there and they care if you're not there. Yes. That's a nice thing too. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Stephanie, what are the qualifications for someone who thinks they might want to try this? Well, if you like music okay. and you find yourself moving when certain 
cut, <laughs> cuts of music come on, this is the class for you. It is, because well, it's, it's really about music. Okay, all right. So no previous dance experience is necessary no, for this no, at all? No, mm -hmm, not at all. Mm -hmm. We do, we have uh, students that are, we're musicians, we're okay. music teachers, uh, we're principals, just mm -hmm. teachers, uh, elementary teachers, never had danced before. Wow. Mm -hmm. But always wanted to. Yes. And that's what's, uh, we love that. That's I, right, try something yeah, new. Something new. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. What about someone who might have had a hip or a knee replacement? Can they even think about doing this? They can, in fact, I just had a student return. She's just had both knees done. Okay. And taking it slow and easy, there's mm -hmm. always a chair to the side if they wanna sit down and they can still move their feet. Mm -hmm. uh, but absolutely, and again, I always, Monitor, make sure, okay. slow and easy, okay. don't overdo. And I understand your class occasionally goes out into Lincoln to we give do. some performances. We do, mm -hmm. we, we like to, um, we've been uh, going to some assisted livings. Okay. And uh, again, just adding some spice and fun. Uh, we find <coughs> the, um, the people at the assisted livings, they tap their foot <laughs> or they sure. bob their heads <laughs> mm -hmm. and making sure that the music they remember. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's yes. really yes. important. Yes, yes. That they know and feel familiar with mm -hmm. and even sing, yeah. even sing along. Well, it would be fun to have such a high energy yeah. kind and, of performance. And we have a birthday tap dance too. Oh, and if okay. we know someone's birthday is right then, then we do a special birthday tap dance for them. There you go. <laughs> I think that's perfect. Yes. Well, I hope I will see you somewhere yes. along the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Stephanie, Joey, thank you very much for being just, with us and giving us just a little taste of what it's like oh, to perform in pleasure. New York. Thank you uh -huh. so much thank for having you. It's been a joy. And we will finish our segment with a, a clip of the tap dance class giving their performance in New York. Enjoy. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. The winter edition of Living Well magazine is now available. You can check it out online at lincoln.ne.gov, keyword aging, or call Aging Partners at 402-441-7070. Welcome to another episode of Live and Learn. I'm your host, Tim Francis. My guest today is the Reverend Nancy Erickson, a longtime Lancaster County resident. Yes. A farm girl. Yes. And um, kind of a community involved a person for a long, long time. Longer than I care to think about, yes. And still ongoing. Yes. You've been involved with a lot of beginning of organizations. That's true. Getting in on something that needed attention or needed some advocacy. What, what was your first engagement? Well, I think the first engagement of real consequence was um, I believe it was 1971 or two, and I was a young professional person here in Lincoln and met a young man who was involved in the VISTA program. That was a university-sponsored program where students could get credit for helping community organizations. He told me about a group of people with disabilities who were meeting. It was just really just a handful of people and asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting, and I did. And that really was the first, that really hooked me. Um, this was a really energetic group of people who felt really strongly about things that needed to be changed in Lincoln so that those of us with disabilities could live 
more normal, active lives at that point in time. I know it's hard to believe because things are so different now. There were no curb cuts in downtown Lincoln. So if you got downtown, you were relegated to one block circling it, <laughs> or um, you had to have someone with you to help you get up and down the curbs. There was no transportation for people with disabilities. There was no housing accommodation that specifically allowed for accessibility for people with disabilities. There were just a myriad of things that weren't here. So the group met, eventually got incorporated, um, chose the name the League of Human Dignity, and so we started working on these issues. Now, these were the days Helen Busalis, Jan Gauger, Sue Bailey, those three women held public offices and really, for some reason, they decided to help us and really got behind us. I remember one day, um, one member of our group spent the day with Helen Busalis when she was mayor and she de decided to spend the day in a wheelchair and she did and um, just spent her day going around and realized how difficult things were. Um, other, other city council women, women uh, decided to do the same kinds of things. And um, we, we got a curb cut ordinance passed. We got, I remember also, um, well, first I'll talk about transportation. We heard about um, monies available through the federal government. Urban Mass Transportation Authority was the name of the agency at the time, had grants to help cities develop a transportation system for people with disabilities, van, van lifts. So we decided we wanted to try to get in on this. So I went around with our VISTA volunteer to various organizations. We had to raise 10% of the monies. So we went around and um, I spoke to Kiwanis clubs and church groups and rotaries and just all kinds of people. And finally, one Kiwanis club here in Lincoln gave us a sizable sum of money, enough so that we could apply for the grant and we got it. That brought the first two handy vans to Lincoln, Nebraska, which then eventually were incorporated into the Lincoln transportation system and now we see handy vans all over town. And disabled constituents. All over town. Out of their <laughs> homes and out on the right, streets. Right, exactly, exactly. And now can get around because there are curb cuts everywhere. And we, we had it early on before there was um, federal legislation, we were able to get an accessibility law passed here in Nebraska. I worked on that legislation with, it was then Senator Don Wesley. Um, spoke in front of the legislature, worked to get that bill passed, and then the governor appointed me to a commission to help oversee that. To oversee the implementation yes, of it and yes. monitor the success mm -hmm, of it. Mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. you had some barriers to work with, I mean, besides physical barriers or public perceptions of what disabled. Right, oh yeah, that's, that's a really good point. You know, we, we had these concrete goals housing, transportation, accessibility, but underlying all of that are the, the myths and stereotypes about people with disabilities. Um, that's a harder nut to crack in some ways. Um, but, but one of the ways, I think the thing that's made the difference is that it's not that unusual to see people with disabilities out and about now. Go downtown and try to find a parking spot, a, a handicapped, mm -hmm. an accessible parking spot. It's hard now. It didn't used to be hard. So there are, there are a lot of people out and about. It's not unusual to see people in chairs and on crutches and other mobility devices out and about. So I think that has, I hope, I hope that has changed some perceptions. Or infor um, informed the public at large. Right, right. But I, I think just like any group that, um, any sort of marginalized group that has, that, that, the, that, that the culture sort of sets aside, um, it's that one-on-one. -on -one. It's when you have a relationship, when you know someone 
that really makes the difference and changes. And goes against stereotypes. Yes, yes, right. And makes a noise. Yes, yes. So did that, that led to your employment with the uh, League of Human Dignity for a Actually, while? Actually, yes, I, I was a voc rehab counselor for the mm -hmm. state for eight years and then, well, and then, um, I, I worked at United Way. I was the uh, planning director the year that the city and county developed their, their joint budget agreement. So I got to be on the ground floor of that. And during that year, the League of Human Dignity was applying for uh, monies to develop a center for independent living. It was going to be a pilot project. There were two of these in the country, I believe, at the time. Uh, and not, so, so then the League, so we got the grant. And I became the first coordinator of this project. So what that did is take the League of Human Dignity from an advocacy agency to also a service agency. So that the League then began developing peer counseling programs and, um, um, gosh, helping people hire attendants. We had case managers to, to help people navigate the system. There are a lot of services available. We're very, very blessed in this city. There's a lot here, but it's not always accessible and people don't always know about it. So we had case managers to help people sort of work their way through the maze of, of services that, that would really help, help their lives. So you became a clearinghouse. Right. That's one of the things, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did you uh, do? How did you evolve from that into your next project. Well, <laughs> what led to well, the okay, so uh, all of this time, all my life, I've asked big questions. Who, who are we? Why are we here? What, you know, what's out there? And um, I, um, well, okay, so I, I left the league. I took a job at what was then SRI, it's now Gallup, and my job was to interview potential priests all over the country. So I, I've always been really involved, in, interested in religion. So this was fascinating for me. So after doing this for, oh, I don't know, a couple of years, my job was to interview priests and see, using our, our instrument, if they would make good priests. So. I'm thinking all the time, I'm interviewing these people, and I'm thinking, hmm, I could do better than that. I would have a better answer than that. And eventually, I'd, I'd always been interested in, as I said, religion and, and faith issues and spirituality. So I started applying to seminaries, just kind of to see what would happen. I didn't know what would happen, and I got accepted at Yale Divinity School. And when a person gets accepted to Yale Divinity School, you don't say no to that. I was convinced they'd made a mistake, that I that they didn't know that I wasn't nearly smart enough. But I went, and I went with the intention of learning. I just I wanted to seep myself in an environment of really smart people and just soak up that culture um, through time and uh, the intervention of some dear people and a lot of discernment. I decided. Rather than just going and getting smarter, I would uh, seek ordination. Put it to use. Right, right. Uh, so I became ordained in the United Church of Christ. When I was first ordained, my ministry, this was, I think this is really telling. I, um, I was a returning student, you know, I didn't go to graduate school. Right. So I had a lot of experience. I mean, I'd done some... I had a lot of a lot of different kinds of experience. I had my profile up and down both coasts. No one called me. One one little church in Oakland, California, a gay lesbian congregation invited me for an interview. All my colleagues who were my contemporaries were getting jobs in churches right and left. I felt like for the first time in my life I was being discriminated against because of my disability. Mm -hmm. So I came home. By churches, no less. By churches, yes, yes. So I came home, back to Lincoln, and just decided, okay, uh, if I'm gonna be a minister, there's gotta be somebody that needs ministering to. And I ended up going to the county jail and uh, uh, organizing the first chaplaincy program at the county jail. 
Then um, my church, the women's board at my church, had started a shelter, daytime shelter for homeless people. The woman who started that, Jane Ellison, left for Africa. So I took over as director of that. I did that for five years. Just kind of, I've always, you know, people say develop a five-year long-range plan. That doesn't work for me. I think I just sort of, things fall my way. And uh, if it feels right, I do it. So, so then, so I, all this time in my, my ministry, I've done very, I worked at, uh, I, I was um, involved with St. Monica's, their drug and alcohol program for women. And eventually then, I decided I really wanted some congregational parish experience. So now I'm at First Plymouth Church. I've been there since 2004. and very happy. You're still engaged and you're in the community. Do you see things, um, make some comparisons with how organizing took place 30, 40 years ago, and what, no. what goes on now, some advantages, some differences, some similarities? Well, I don't, I'm not out there on the vanguard as much as I used to be, but I, and I don't, I hope this isn't true, but one of my observations is that younger people don't quite have the fire. Um, and probably because we're standing on the shoulders of all of these, we have this legacy of people who made a lot of positive changes. And so maybe younger people don't see the need as much as we did, I don't know. Um, but my hope is that, that people, younger people can get themselves inspired and we can help them get inspired um, to make some changes because boy, there's a lot a lot to do yet. Nancy, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. You're very, welcome. You're gracious to share that with us. Live and Learn, we'll be right back. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. The winter edition of Living Well Magazine is now available. You can check it out online at lincoln.ne.gov, keyword aging, or call Aging Partners at 402-441-7070. Welcome back to Live and Learn. Today I want to discuss legal issues that may be of concern to uh, maturing citizens. And to help us understand this, our guest is Mary Wilson, who is the principal attorney at the Buford Law Company in the Lu Buford Law offices in Omaha and is the legal counselor at the Aging Partners Office in Lincoln. Mary, what subject is most asked of you regarding aging issues? Um, it's, it's wide areas, but probably Medicare, Medicaid, um, Social Security issues, powers of attorneys, very popular, nursing home information. That uh, Medicaid, Medicare issue is uh, something that people are interested in and they don't really realize how little help they can get from Medicare and that they have to have uh, poverty conditions to qualify for Medicaid. I so think that's true in both instances. Um, most people are surprised that Medicare only covers skilled nursing care uh, for up to 100 days following a three-day hospitalization. It surprises them that that ends it. And um, the other thing that's surprising about Medicaid is they think, well, you have to have nothing in order to qualify when there's actually a program, sometimes called uh, spousal impoverishment, sometimes called division of resources, that does in fact uh, financially protect one spouse when the other spouse has some type of a catastrophic health problem. Yes, we should go into that a little mo bit more in detail, but I want the viewers to know that Aging Partners offices 
has a counseling for long-term care insurance, Medicare coverage, and uh, for other issues of concern to, uh, to aging individuals. And uh, they're very complicated issues, such as in uh, long-term care insurance partnering, also protect some of your assets while you still can qualify for Medicaid. So people right. need to go down to uh, aging or contact aging partners and actually talk to some of the counselors about that, including you as one of the counselors. Right, we have two additional financial counselors and then myself as the attorney. And uh, there is a partnership plan and people don't realize that, that there are certain types of long-term care insurance that you can buy and when you spend your assets down to an amount equal to what the coverage is, yes. you don't have to spend down any further before you qualify for Medicaid. Right. And that's something to really consider when you're shopping for long-term care insurance, right. whether to go with a partner plan or not. The fact that folks are uh, asking you those kind of questions when actually there are other counselors for that suggests uh, the other complicated issues uh, such as, again, the AB trust would be one where that's where you have the spousal separation of assets. Right. Tell us a little more about that, Mary. Yeah, AB trust is used to refer to a couple that establish a trust where they transfer their assets um, into the name of a trustee that's usually themselves um, to hold the assets. And then when one spouse dies, the trust is broken into two parts a marital deduction trust and a family trust and this allows the couple to reduce or eliminate federal estate taxes yes. um, as well as avoid probate. Yes and also if they have separate assets one can become impoverished and the other can retain a reasonable set of assets and the impoverished one would qualify for Medicaid again. Yeah, so. that, that involves uh, use of irrevocable trusts and that's something you wanna get very uh, good counsel on before you think yes. about trying to do that. There are uh, many, many rules involving uh, irrevocable trusts. Um, sometimes people and set up an irrevocable trust and it gets them in, in a lot of trouble. So uh, that is something you wanna be careful about, uh, get, get good counsel before you think about it. Yes, a lot of these items do need expert counseling. Mm -hmm. And there are other trust arrangements that people should uh, consider in handling their assets too, such as living, living trusts would be something, like there's a revocable and irrevocable mm -hmm that actually protects you from probate things that day, isn't there, I mean? Right, both irrevocable and revocable trusts can uh, protect you from probate, um, which is the court administration of your estate after you die. Um, but then some other goals will determine whether you should be thinking about irrevocable or revocable trusts. Yes, such as, I'm aware of the fact that many people actually put their property into joint tenancy with their heirs and in fact that has a definite tax disadvantage in as much as the t value of that asset be becomes what the parent bought it at instead of what it would be at the time they uh, were deceased. And yeah, so that's they, the, the difference they, between carryover basis and stepped yes, up basis yes. and I, I think the best example of that is with the home. If you make your child a joint owner on that home and they don't live in that house um, when they go to sell it, they could get some heavy-duty taxes. Yes. Whereas if you use the arrangement of transferring it to them but keeping a life estate in the parent, then they're going to get a 100% stepped-up basis. And yes, that's could make a big basis. difference when the parent dies and the house yes. is later sold. And that's kind of a trust that you'd also have to go it's into, sometimes, right? I mean, you could, it's sometimes you could called a poor man trust. trust. And poor interesting, man. you should bring that up because there's been a recent change in the law up until very recently, that arrangement could only be done irrevocably. So once you transferred the house to your kids, if you later became unhappy with them, you, you were yes. stuck. You couldn't undo it yourself. You had to have yes. children's cooperation. And now you can do that so it can be undone, um, but then it doesn't, it might not accomplish some other goals that you have, but it would avoid probate, would give them the stepped up basis. Um, 
and it could be undone if you later became disenchanted with your children's conduct in some yes, way. Yes, yes, and I'll bet you do encounter some family difficulties like that in your counseling. It, it's kind of surprising to me because that's a very popular tool for estate planning and I'm somewhat surprised, but yes, occasionally yeah. I've run into a problem where the yeah. child has turned out to be not very trustworthy and, and while the house is not in danger while the parent's alive, it kind of makes the well, parent stay in a home maybe longer than they would have cases, wanted to. In some cases, assets can be expended by uh, people in, involved in a divorce and everything because mm -hmm. they actually own, had joint ownership in the house, for example, if yeah. there was a divorce and things like that. So yeah, that's more, more rare because of the divorce rules, but yes, it oh, certainly really? could be going to the mix. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, what, what other legal issues do you encounter quite frequently? I, in this, I such think as, uh, people are you know, really concerned about how to handle things if they become incapacitated. Yes and they need to pick out agents and they need to know what tools to give those agents and we're usually talking about advanced directives like the health care power of attorney and the living will which explains to the doctor how you want a final illness handled and then of course your health care power of attorney your financial power of attorney um, and making sure that those are set up so that there's alternatives in case the person you've picked becomes unable to do it? Is there someone else in place? And do you have somebody trustworthy there's, that can handle that? There's so many options that actually that's why people need to talk to mm -hmm. uh, experts uh, counseling uh, such as yourself and yeah. some of the counselor down there because there are lots of options and people need to think about how they do want end of life yeah. issues to be settled. And, you know? and I always, you know, people always say, well, can I just get a form on the internet yes. and do this for free? Of course you can but you're not really paying the attorney for the form, you're paying the attorney for the time sure. they spend counseling you because so many people come in and they think, oh, this is what I want. And then after you visit with them for a while, they realize, oh man, I didn't yes. want that at all. I really wanted this or this form. Yes. Well, did you realize this form said this? Well, no, I sure didn't. I just thought mm -hmm. they were all the same. And so you're, you're paying for the counseling, not for the form itself. Well, bankruptcy issues could be another concern of the aging partners, a aging people in the area because uh, the Lincoln Gas Utility used to be an Enron company and there's a lot of people in Omaha who actually trusted the Enron companies enough that they didn't diversify their assets and so now that when they have aging expenses they really can't cover them very well because of the losses that they incurred due to Enron. So It's a very good point. You know, 32 years ago when I started this practicing in this area, I never had clients with debt problems and now it's relatively common. And the issue is always, you know, should I file bankruptcy and go through that expense or is there some other alternative? And again, some fairly recent changes in the law benefit yeah. seniors. Um, it used to be that, you know, Social Security has been protected for a long time from garnishment and attachment by creditors but the senior used to have to actually let the court know that it was Social Security. So by the time the bank held the funds and then the consumer went to court and got them released, sometimes they would bounce a bunch of checks and have huge um, check charges. Mm -hmm. Well now, as long as the income is direct deposited into the bank account and you can clearly identify that it's Social Security or SSI or Veterans Pensions, the bank can't even hold it. Um, there's one other caveat. It, it cannot, the balance of the account cannot exceed two times whatever that monthly income is. So if your Social Security is 100 a month and the account is less than 200, they're not going to be able to even hold it. So well, important in consumer protection. That, yes, that, but that does just emphasize the fact that the issues are complicated enough that they really shouldn't be making those decisions at home. They should talk to someone. And, and so. Well, right. I think sometimes we'll have a consumer who, like, just didn't deposit their Social Security check in the bank because they thought, well, you know, I want to protect it in case my creditors start going after it. Well, problem with that, of course, is the danger of having the check come to the house. And now, of course, you can't have the check come to your house. You either have to have a debit card or a direct, direct deposit. deposit yeah. and the debit card, if you lose it, you're kind of in trouble. So um, it's important information to know. Well, all of these point to the fact that uh, we need expert counseling 
and can obtain such counseling at the Aging Partners Office with uh, questions on this, these matters. Now, now in your practice in, at, at, as counselor at Aging Partners, do you get all older people that are the concerns or you get a mix of people or what kind of no, clients do you talk my, to? Well, my, our clients are all 60, age 60 and above oh. and um, pretty much anyone's allowed to come in and ask questions on most topics and then um, income resource screening is done for direct services and I don't actually do the screening that's no. done by the aging partners um, but it is a resource that is available and you're certainly welcome people to come and use us. Well I would like to thank today's guest Mary Wilson who is uh, principal at uh, Buford Law in Omaha and the legal counselor at uh, Aging Partners Office in Lincoln. Live and Learn will return in just a moment. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. The winter edition of Living Well Magazine is now available. You can check it out online at lincoln.ne.gov, keyword aging, or call Aging Partners at 402-441-7070. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Dolores Lentel, one of the hosts. We're all aware of Fleming Fields in Normandy and the importance of their history. However, did you know that there's a Fleming Fields in Lincoln? And I have someone here today who knows the story. He's Rick, Rick Sutton. He is a prof professor of agronomy at uh, University of Nebraska. And he's going to tell us about Fleming Fields in Lincoln. Welcome, Rick. I'm so glad you're doing yeah, this today. Yeah. Well, good to be here, Dolores. Haven't seen you in a long time since we <laughs> used to be at Clinton together at uh, right. Clinton Neighborhood Organization. Long time ago. And of course, the Flemings were uh, uh, fixtures in the Clinton neighborhood for years. Right. Uh, their um, uh, mother, uh, Ruth uh, Bates Fleming, and uh, the father lived uh, at about 30th and Leighton for years and years. She was uh, uh, quite an interesting individual, uh, uh, a graduate of UNL in botany, mm -hmm. and uh, she was also accredited, accredited with being one of the, the uh, people that started the Nebraska State Parks or got them on the, uh, got them on the, uh, the board. Okay. Uh, the, the the brothers I think got their love of flowers and growing things probably from their mother, although as youngsters they would uh, uh, carefully craft carnations and sell those at the Husker football game so people could uh, could decorate their uh, uh, their lapels, and uh, they also had uh, and I'm I'm not sure where they got this love but they also had uh, quite a love of uh, music as well. Oh, really? So yeah, the, the history of this goes back a long way. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, Ruth Bates graduated from UNL in 1901. Really? So that's that's over 100 years ago. Yeah, so yeah. the story begins a long time ago. Yeah. So um, they were influenced um, by their mother and their father because he was obviously uh, interested in flowers and took them to the games with him. Um, Tell us then about the brothers, uh, well, when they came back from the war and how this all began. Yeah, they, they, with this love of flowers, they came back from the war and, and started to uh, grow uh, a chrysanthemums, and that's where they were getting them for the Husker games. But they also became very interested in, uh, in plant breeding, and uh, I'm sure that was part of their uh, mother's interest in botany. And they began to grow uh, plants and became quite interested with uh, creating plants that uh, nobody could grow around here or, or, or bring them on to the scene, so to speak. Uh, they, uh, they were expert plant hybridizers. Uh, and there must be a science that goes into that that they right, they, perfected. It's, and they did, they did plant breeding the old way. They would do their crosses, then they'd s save the seed, they'd plant that out, then they'd select the plants they wanted, and uh, 
They used to have a, um, a, a mail order business where you, you could buy their chrysanthemums mainly, and then uh, they would also wholesale, mm -hmm. and you could also go to their uh, to 30th and Leighton and buy them directly from them. Mm -hmm. But they left their plants in the ground for five to 10 years to make sure that they would survive and be hardy and disease resistant and so, so forth. So some of their plants then uh, became winter hardy as opposed yeah. to something that yeah. wouldn't grow well in Nebraska. Well, that, that's one of the things that they started looking at. Uh, anybody driving around eastern Nebraska that sees these gigantic, uh, and maybe we could get it up on the uh, picture up on the, yeah. the uh, screen, uh, gigantic hibiscus, uh, they will see uh, probably a plant that was created by the uh, Fleming Brothers. Mm -hmm. There it is on the screen now. now. Those plants have been around for a long time, but they didn't have hardiness here in our harsh winters. Okay. So that's what they were able to, to, to breed into the plants. Okay, so you could plant them for one year and then it would be gone and yeah, then you'd have, you'd have to, to start again, over again. So. Okay. Uh, the other one that they, that they worked on quite a bit, besides the mums and the, uh, the hibiscus, was also a crepe myrtle, Logostromia. Mm -hmm. And uh, crepe myrtle really grows further south from here. You find it in Oklahoma City and mm -hmm. Dallas and uh, they have come up with plants or, or selections that are now hardy here. I, I was just showing some to my class uh, earlier this semester on mm -hmm. city campus. So those are, are, are quite nice. They also have had uh, uh, some carnations that they also bred but okay. th there were a number of uh, uh, mums and uh, those were kind of their stock plants. Mm -hmm. So they were uh, unusual. Uh, their names uh, were Bob, Jim, and Dave, right? Right. right. And um, they were unusual in the fact that they were barely over five foot tall, yeah, I were, understand. They were short guys, yeah. But they became giants in their own field. So Absolutely. They, um, uh, the, uh, uh, they were members of the, the Nebraska nurserymen, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, were, were uh, pretty good neighbors to have. Mm -hmm. They had something going on in their backyard all yep, the time. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, as they got a little bit older and a little less uh, able to get around, some of their fields looked a little uh, a little seedy, but the plants were still there and they remembered where they were. And, mm -hmm. and of course, as you remember, uh, that, uh, that area was targeted to be the, the path of the Northeast Radio. Right. And uh, they, you know, they, got in, they got involved with the neighborhood organization at the time. And, I, I, to tell you the truth, I can't remember whether they were pro or con on the radio thing, but they <laughs> they were uh, they were involved. Well, and the uh, interesting thing about it is um, the park that's now dedicated there is actually on the site where yes. they lived yeah. and where their research fields yeah. were. So it's particularly appropriate. Yeah, Fleming Fields. You could think about it as being athletic fields. You could think about it as uh, as being a parkland, but it was also the fields where they were growing and trialing these plants at. Mm -hmm. And they were almost to the point of obsession with it. This is what they did. Yeah, and yeah. It, um, it just dominated their life. Yeah, yeah. They, um, they were a unique combination of talent and uh, determination and effort Certainly. put into it. Yeah. Now, um, some of the uh, blooms that you've described, there's one that now is up on the screen. Um, it's enormous in size yeah, when you compare yeah, it huge. to that hat. They're huge. That's uh, that's uh, uh, Dave right there, mm -hmm. uh, late in life. But uh, he's got it in his got it in his hat band, and uh, you know it's almost as big as his head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a remarkable thing that they have accomplished. Um, and I understand that this its business goes on even though uh, the last of the Fleming brothers died in two thousand one. Right. Uh, it goes on with another a company has uh, taken well, up the uh, yeah they, the there's uh, uh, an apprentice by the name of Gretchen Seidig who worked within the last uh, few years that they were alive understood their techniques and uh, got uh, access to their germplasm she's now in California growing it but you can go on if you if you uh, uh, Google Fleming Fields it'll take you to their website and you okay. can still get a lot of these uh, materials that they developed they're still available. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing when when they passed away as a part of their uh, uh, wills the uh, university was given money for student scholarships and also in horticulture and also uh, there was a small uh, endowment for, for uh, grant funds and uh, 
I'm particularly happy to talk to you about the Flemings today because I've gotten some of the, the Fleming Horticulture Research Funds okay. and it's allowing me to, to do some of my research on green roof plants. Okay. Well, that's good. It continues yeah. on that. Sure. And I understand um, next to the dairy store on East Campus, there is a plot that's reserved right. or what is it called? It's called the Fleming Slope and they, okay. uh, they planted a number of the plants that uh, uh, the Flemings grew and not necessarily just the ones they developed, but they, they grew some other ones that they sold. And so if someone's coming over to get a uh, ice cream corn at the dairy store, they can kind of walk around to the east side and see the Fleming Slope. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's that's nice. And that's maintained by the university right. and just kept as a part on of as a a Maxwell Arboretum. Uh, yeah, and it's just a legacy to the Fleming brothers. Um, anything else that we've we've missed? We've talked about their their business and it's available online. Um, the research that you uh, talk about is um, is an endowment from a will. Yeah, they there. gave, uh, and I can't remember the exact amount, but that's to be used for uh, horticulture research at UNL. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the uh, we write proposals every couple years to get access to those funds. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've been using mine for uh, green roof research, uh, mm -hmm. plants that will grow up there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I guess the other thing that we need to emphasize, uh, we mentioned in passing, but uh, where their house and their field stood is now largely uh, a recreation complex that's mm -hmm. also enjoyed by uh, students at the university and also by citizens in, in the city mm -hmm. because there's softball fields there and there's a park there and there's a bike path that meanders. Uh, right after the, uh, uh, the Fleming Field Park was built, there were a number of beds put in to try to uh, uh, plant some of their material. The problem with that is that those do take up cape, so those kind of faded away oh, over time. So, okay. But uh, there's the, the Fleming Fields is still there and it's, uh, it's used by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on June 24th, 2004, a recreational park at 31st and Layton was formally dedicated by the University of Nebraska as Fleming Fields in recognition of their work and to honor their legacy. And to borrow a line from Paul Harvey, now you know the rest of the story. Mm -hmm.